Well, let's take a look at another CDV and another carte de visite for those at home. Uh, carte de visite being French, and since the purpose in 1860, 1865, photography is finally getting commercial. Uh, if you want to sell something, give it a French name. <laughs> we won't call these photographs or pictures. We'll call them carte de visites. And, uh, and for the first time, nice. they can be uh, mass produced and traded, and you can get a signed picture. You can get a signed picture of your favorite person. Here's uh, a CDV, a carte de visite of General uh, Pierre Gustave Touton oh. <laughs> Beauregard, and uh, signed. And then, as I'm going to move this for a second here, as Beauregard liked to do, he had too much signature to sign the front. So he would always turn your CDV <laughs> over and give you a good signature, a nice long signature on on the back. Um, Rob, let's talk about the judgment of Jefferson Davis and some of his generals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, PGT Beauregard, or GT Beauregard, as he likes to sign his name, is uh, certainly one of the best trained Confederates, and he's right there at the beginning, but somewhere he and Jeff Davis part Company. Yeah, well, the Beauregard is one of these generals that was so f consumed with himself that he forgot his cause. <laughs> uh, Beauregard is a talented military engineer. Uh, he's the commander responsible for giving the order to fire the shots upon Fort Sumter to start the war. Uh, then he's one of the heroes of Bull Run. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's immediately thereafter that he gets involved in his uh, imbroglio with Davis over questions of rank and authority and, you know, I'm too busy, I'm, I'm, I'm within sound of the guns as I'm writing my dispatches. Mm -hmm. and, it, and he's so pompous and so self-important that later he's almost, uh, he's almost a, a buffoon when it comes to these plans because he would, he would come up with these intricate, elaborate campaign plans that were based in fantasy and not practical reality. And he, he really runs afoul, and some will say it's a blessing, and some will say it's a curse, depending on who you are in the Army of Tennessee. After Corinth, which he, he holds until the very last possible minute when he realizes that regardless of his best efforts, Halleck is going to stumble into town, and so he <laughs> takes the whole Confederate Army and trains them and gets out, uh, duping nobody but Halleck, and uh, goes on sick leave like almost everybody else in both armies at that time mm -hmm. without deigning to notify the War Department and there's the, mm -hmm. there's the reason for his uh, exodus. When he, when he came west, it was he thought, the Confederates thought that he would be bringing troops but he was regarded that just his very presence was worth 10,000 men in the field. I mean that's how high regarded he was. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, his stock had fallen woefully with uh, the Davis administration, but he still does some very good duty in South Carolina, uh, the defenses of Petersburg against overwhelming odds. Uh, he's mm -hmm. able to stop uh, several thrusts upon Petersburg when it was ripe for the taking. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't uh, he doesn't measure up. He, he wouldn't make anybody's top ten list, but early mm -hmm. in the war he'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that was more popular than him, especially mm -hmm. after Bull Run. Did you find uh, differences in the tones of the quotes? depending on whether the quote came, was See, about. Now, one, of, one of the things that really surprised me, and, and I'm not sure what the reason for it is, because some of the quotes are, are pre-war, some of them are mm -hmm. from like Mexican War experiences, but there's almost a two-to-one disparity in the number of things that I was able to find from Union and Confederate generals. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, a dearth on, on some of these people. How is it possible that nobody wrote about this guy? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they didn't survive. <laughs> or, or, or maybe, maybe they didn't write it down, or maybe it's there, but it's in the archival repositories right. that I that I had to not utilize mm -hmm. uh, in the main for, for doing this. But uh, there is a change over time with the perception of some of these people. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the one noteworthy comment about Beauregard in particular is from the British Observer, Colonel Fremantle. Uh, he made his way, he landed at Brownsville, Texas, and made his way across the Confederacy to get mm -hmm. to Gettysburg just in time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what, a, what a good trip he had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but his comment about Beauregard is that the striking thing about him was his appearance and that his everyday appearance had changed drastically in just a couple of years from the, the photographs that everybody was familiar with. Mm -hmm. And some people attributed all his gray hair to 
the uh, stress and strain of command. But the real reason was perhaps the effectiveness of the Yankee blockade, which excluded certain island, items of toiletry, which had, <laughs> <laughs> which had previously the Grecian kept formula. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it, it's kind of funny. But Beauregard is one of those that you either loved or hated. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Daniel in Chicago. What is your favorite? Uh, what is your favorite quote? Is there one particularly snappy oh, one? That, oh gosh. Well, I, I would I would beg. There's of course. I, I co-edited the, the memoirs of General John Pope, and of course, no one can forget the immortal words of Brigadier General Sam Sturgis during the height of the second Bull Run campaign, when he's told he can't interfere with the military railroads because these supplies are going to Pope's army, which is fighting a battle right now, by the mm -hmm. way, and uh, Sturgis's immortal words are that I don't care a pinch of all dung for John Pope, <laughs> <laughs> which almost got him arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the one quote that I find compelling really is from is with the accession of Robert E. Lee to command of the Army in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. And McClellan, George B. McClellan, everybody's favorite whipping boy, uh, writes his assessment of Robert E. Lee at, at replacing Johnston. And he says that he prefers Johnston to Lee because Lee is too cautious and, and he's bound to show he doesn't have the moral courage to act in times of emergency to, to be uh, effective, an effective leader. And if, if you know the history of McClellan and you know the character of Lee and you were just given this quote and you knew that it referred to the two, everybody would bet that it was okay. Lee talking about McClellan. <laughs> and it's insights like that where I think sometimes the person that's describing somebody is really revealing more about himself than he is about the person he's talking about. Yeah. A major part, Margaret, a major part of your book, and I, I guess we've been throwing parts around it up to this <laughs> point, it's, we talk about systems of care, we talk about hospitals. The United States Sanitary Commission, the United States Sanitary Commission was one of those systematic, revolutionary system uh, systems that were created. I'm going to, I want to look at another, uh, at another artifact before we do it, because we have good artifacts for this show. Uh, the Northwest Sanitary Fair, uh, organized by Chicago's own Mary Livermore, right. uh, was uh, had a couple of uh, summers worth of very successful support of the soldiers. Here is an artifact from the Northwest Sanitary Fair. It was uh, an oil on oil on uh, canvas painting from life of the candidate, the Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln signed by Charles Merck in uh, 1860. And it was, it was auctioned at the Northwest Sanitary Fair because part of what the Sanitary Fair was about was raising money to support. Right. And so this was auctioned in, uh, I believe in 1865, about, for about $64, uh, gifted back a couple of times and finally sold to uh, a Mr. Huff, Charles Huff maybe, uh, a meatpacking magnate in, in Chicago. But this is the kind of thing, this is a, a relic of those auxiliary systems that were created in the Civil War to support the soldiers. So let me ask you about the United States Sanitary Commission. Where did that come from and what is the, the philosophical underpinning of that organization? Well, when I introduced the USSC, to use the short name, um, I tend to say it's a Red Cross-like institution because that lets me go on and talk about them. But mm -hmm. the more complicated answer, and there was no Red Cross yet in the Civil War, is that there was a vast outpouring of women wanting to do something. This is all northern side for this particular organization. They had a big meeting. They were ready to go. They wanted to organize clothing for the troops, medicines for the troops, help set up hospitals, all this sort of thing, do the sort of thing that women did when somebody got sick. Um, and they uh, built an organization that had men at the top. In part, if you want to you know, be politically savvy, you need men who can organize the whole thing and, as they said, channel the energies of the women. So. Um, the Sanitary Commission was founded in the spring of 1861, not long after Lincoln issued his call, first call for troops. And they spent the war 
doing the kinds of things the Army didn't seem able to do for itself. The Army got better over the war, but not entirely so. So, for example, I mentioned pajamas before. Women knew that men needed nightshirts when they got sick. They needed sheets on their beds. They needed just vast quantities of things for comfort, for recovery. And so the Sanitary Commission people organized food to get to the troops. Mary Livermore here in Chicago has a wonderful description in her memoirs of do you sell her memoirs? <laughs> well, <laughs> we should. can get them. <laughs> okay. Um, she talks about the smell of the Sanitary Commission um, uh, warehouse, if you will, all the food that had come in and that they were turning around and sending out again. And I particularly liked that sense of the smell of the place. When, when Grant's army is in Tennessee and starts to have scurvy, the call goes to Mary Livermore, who in turn organizes the Midwest you know, talk to the telegrams to, to Oshkosh, telegrams to the Upper Peninsula, telegrams everywhere to Iowa. Send, oddly enough, for scurvy, potatoes, onions, pickles. And so you get this stream of goods down the river to Tennessee to feed Grant's army. You would think the Union Army would know how to feed people, but they tend to go with salt meat, hardtack, not fruits and vegetables. The Sanitary Commission provided the fruits and vegetables. They brought in lemons. They sent all these canned goods, like canned condensed milk, chocolate. There was even a Sanitary Commission decision to send ice cream to the City Point hospitals on the peninsula of Virginia in 1864. So Union troops in hospital were much better fed, better clothed, better cared for because of the Sanitary Commission. The South had lots of local versions of that but they weren't as well organized. And people have talked about the fact that it's hard to be simultaneously states' rights and nationally organized. It's sort of well-known tension about the Southern structures of organization. So the Sanitary Commission achieved all that and left lots of papers for the historian to use at the New York Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> lots of bright lights shining on Yes, there. yes. Well, is there, uh, you've mentioned uh, the that the Confederacy didn't have the same types of organizations, but uh, how effective was uh, Surgeon General Samuel Preston Moore uh, in responding to Confederate medical crises? Uh, did he have some success in, in creating good, decent systems of medical care for Confederates? Well, one thing to realize is Moore and his best men, the, the elite doctors in the Confederacies, they were often trained in exactly the same places as the Union doctors, many of them at the University of Pennsylvania. They knew the same things, they had the same goals, they wanted to build the same kinds of hospitals based on the same principles. But there's wanting and there's getting. <laughs> and if you want to build, say, pavilion hospitals, like I was talking about, these long sheds made out of cheap wood, but just wood, you need wood and nails and hammers, and the Confederacy didn't always have wood and nails and hammers and a man to swing that hammer. So the Confederate hospitals constantly suffered from lack of supplies. The, the blockade had an effect. There was less quinine in the South, for example, and there was a lot of malaria, so they needed those medicines. And they also just suffered from the lack of everything. I came across some papers in the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond that talked about the fact that surgeons in hospitals in Virginia were ordered to stop wrapping sheets around dead Confederates when you buried them. So mm -hmm. send us back their uniform because we need to wash it and you know reuse it and bury them naked. Mm -hmm. So the heroes of the Confederacy can't even have a sheet because we don't have enough sheets. The South had cotton, but the South didn't produce fabrics. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have bottles to put medicine in. They didn't have the medicines. They didn't have enough food. At that same point when the Sanitary Commission was sending ice cream to City Point, 20, 25 miles, whatever distance is to Richmond, the Richmond hospitals, they were eating rats and starving. So that's, a, that's the, Preston, Samuel Preston Moore tried and he wanted to do all this elevation of the profession, education, literature, medical society discussion, but you can't fight against starving patients as yeah. a, in, in outcomes. Well, let me put both of you to work here. Ah. Let's get some signatures <laughs> on some of the books that have been pre-ordered. If you have not ordered your book yet, you still have plenty of time to do so. We will have books available to you 
signed first editions of both of these books available to you after uh, the program is over. If you're watching this on the archive, uh, give us a call. Check out our website, virtualbooksigning.net. Go to the previous uh, books from previous uh, programs page. We probably have signed first editions in stock for you. Uh, while, they're, uh, while our authors are signing your books, I want to thank some of the folks who have uh, ordered the book. And uh, we are genuinely thankful for you because you are why we're able to continue to do this. Dan in Downers Grove, uh, Doug in Louisville, Kentucky, Arthur in Amisville, Virginia, the Smith family in Longwood, Florida, thank you as always. Uh, Lance in Ottawa Hills, Ohio. Todd is in Des Moines, Iowa, thank you, Todd. Christopher in Parsonsfield, Maine. Mark in Madison, North Carolina. Donald in Carmichael, California. Stuart in... And during the course of the fall, you're going to meet uh, James M. McPherson is going to come back to talk about Jefferson Davis. Harold Holzer will be here to talk about Lincoln in the press. Jonathan Sarno, Lincoln and the Jews. Uh, Timothy B. Smith will here to be here to talk about the Battle of Shiloh. And I think we can strongly assume that Rob Girardi will be back <laughs> to discuss uh, the biography of General Governor Warren. How is that going, Rob? Well, we're... Uh we haven't seen page proofs yet, but we're, we're working on that. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, the next couple of weeks, trying to work in the last few more sources, so we have everything uh, polished off. But th that's going to be an exciting new look at uh, a general who's received severe treatment from history. I don't think anybody would like to be defined strictly by the people who are instrumental in destroying their careers and then <laughs> reviling them in the pages of history. And this isn't necessarily... Uh, uh, a, a revision to glorify uh, G.K. Warren, but it is an attempt to show him warts and all as the man that he was and deserves to be remembered mm -hmm. as, and has so long not been um, recognized. For. An interesting guy. He's got the sweet spot on Little Round Top. He's the in bronze. He's the guy everyone visits, but uh, we don't know much about the, him. The most widely recognized Civil War monument, probably, and the most photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one, one. Uh, misfortune away from army command at, at the time of his relief he, there's only one corps commander in the civil war and either army relieved in action and it was gk warren on april 1st of 1865 after having just won a battle after having won the <laughs> it's unparalleled well, thank you rob margaret what is uh, what is on your agenda do you have uh, any projects coming up well i i got interested in the role of uh Physicians, the Sanitary Commission, and the Prisoner of War debates of the 1864 election cycle, and how, you know, the whole story of how Andersonville was received. So, hmm. my next project is Prisoners of War. Prisoners I of think. War. We didn't even get to those in, in this no? book, and you do talk about that. There's a lot that we didn't talk about, but that's why you need to buy the books. To, <laughs> Good idea. We, we didn't come here to give it all away uh, for you. Uh, so, Thank you very much, Margaret Humphreys. Thank you very much, Robert Girardi. And thank you to your publishers, Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, publishers of Marrow of Tragedy, and uh, Zenith Press, the publisher of the Civil War Generals. Uh, do remember, we do have them uh, in stock for you, signed and ready to ship um, uh, as soon as we're done here today. Thank you very much for joining us on Virtual Book Signing. Uh, join us next time. Thank you to uh, Daniel Weinberg, working on camera today, doing a fine job, I'm sure. Thank you to everybody who, uh, who came out and joined us live. You're going to have a chance to meet the authors now that we're finished. Thank you to the staff of, Virtual, of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. We certainly couldn't make this happen without you. And uh, come back and join us next time on Virtual Book Signing.